Hello to the group formerly known as History 17B, Autumn Quarter 23, and who are now a both more narrow and a more broad group. I have been distracted and only just realized that I posted the first two lectures of Module D without actually introducing the module itself. Module D covers the 1920s and 1930s, and I've called it Boom, Bust, and Bandages. So far, we've covered the boom of the 1920s and the bust that occurred right as the decade ended. In this lecture and the next, we will look at different approaches to helping the United States as a whole meet the challenges of crash, depression, and dust bowl, first under the Hoover administration in this lecture and then under FDR in the next lecture. This is one of those long lectures, the Hoover part of it, so I have divided it into two parts. When we left off last lecture, things in the U.S. were looking pretty dismal. Wall Street had crashed and banks and businesses went into tailspins. U.S. farmers and industry produced more than they could sell, just as global trade suffered in the wake of the Wall Street crash and Holly Smoot tariff. Unemployment hit 25% on average, but the working class and minority communities got hit the worst. Banks foreclosed on homes, farms, everything. The center of the country was turning into a desert of raging dust storms, and the dispossessed started heading west, even entire families, often on foot, looking for migrant labor wherever they could possibly find it. We know that under Hoover, Congress passed the Holly Smoot Tariff. In this lecture, we will look at how Hoover dealt with issues within the U.S. From there, we will look at the election of 1932. Spoiler, Hoover was not reelected. And next lecture, we will pick up with what the new president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or FDR, did with the catastrophic mess that he inherited on taking office. Hoover was very much of the support big business and rely on philanthropy type, but it had already been clear in previous decades that big business was unwilling to share profits directly with workers, and philanthropy was completely inadequate to deal with catastrophe on a national scale. Hoover's economic approach to solving Depression-era disasters was conservative and along the lines of what we might now call trickle-down economics. His idea was that by supporting banks and big money at the top, the benefits would trickle down to ordinary citizens. Unfortunately, his method offered zero relief to those in the bottom tiers of society. For people on the ground, the programs felt more like hoovering up. Hoover's government loans required collateral, which the poor did not have, particularly as all that they owned had been repossessed. And Hoover's loans had high interest rates, which the poor could not pay. Hoover's government loans went to banks and big corporations or industrial agriculture farms. The slide is my personal joke. Hoover, in addition to the name of a former president, is a brand of vacuum cleaners. In England, vacuuming is called hoovering. So Hoover up economics is a silly historian's joke, but it also represents how people felt in the early 1930s. It was difficult for people to wait for money to trickle down to them while they starved and lost their homes, small businesses, and farms. And you can see from the political cartoon for the period, the banking system is not passing on the food across the table to the people, but is in fact consuming it all itself. Hoover called for volunteerism, which is the expectation that charitable agencies and private philanthropy should provide disaster relief with no input from the federal government. Hoover himself donated money, and in fact, charitable and philanthropic giving was at an all-time high during the early Depression, and people, ordinary people, were still homeless and still going hungry. When I talked about Carnegie and philanthropy, I pointed out the disconnect 
between someone who is certain that their children will be alive the next day and those who know that their children really might not be. If you saw the coda to the last lecture, the photo that you are looking at here, which is named the damaged child, this is one of Dorothea Lang's photographs. Many organizations like Salvation Army groups and churches opened up soup kitchens and bread mines to feed people. This was extremely uncomfortable for those who were accustomed to working and who had been sold the self-made man story. They were now in the position of having to ooze gratitude for charity. Beyond the humiliation, however, charitable organizations were often located in cities which was not much help to folks who didn't live in urban areas. But even in cities, the supply of food reliant on volunteerism simply could not keep up with the numbers of unemployed and hungry people. At best, volunteerism resulted in spotty and inadequate short-term relief. All of these people in the picture on the slide that are filling up the entire pavement or sidewalk on the side there almost, they are all waiting in line to get food from a single kitchen. The real world also was not always the warm, fuzzy, moral high ground volunteerism that Hoover had in mind. One of the most efficient soup kitchens, regularly serving three meals a day, was in Chicago, and it was run by Al Capone. Al Capone had amassed a fortune running bootleg liquor in the heady days of the 1920s, good times. That coincided with prohibition. Al Capone had not been above killing folks and bribing police. He was, in fact, a gangster. In the 1930s, he had his money and was looking to clean up his image. And in truth, he helped these folks that you see on the slide more efficiently than Hoover did, and the unemployed knew it. Take that for a message. In fact, people had as much fun with using Hoover's name to criticize him as I had in the earlier slide. It was a rather bitter type of humor, but it was still humor as a coping mechanism. The lower sign between the two children here on the slide reads, hard times are still hoovering over us. A Hoover blanket was an old newspaper used when sleeping in shelters or outdoors. Hoover hogs were wild armadillos caught for food. Hoover flags were empty pockets turned inside out because they had nothing in them. A Hoover wagon was an automobile drawn by a horse because the owner could not afford gasoline. Hoover leather was cardboard used to line a shoe when the sole wore through because these people were walking hundreds of miles. Hoover Pullmans were freight cars used as shelter. You might remember from the Pullman strike when we were talking about labor unrest that Pullman cars were luxury railroad cars completely out of reach to the folks who actually built them. Pullman was also the philanthropist who built a town for his workers in which he controlled every aspect of their lives and from which he expelled them when keeping them employed would cut into his profits. Probably the most famous of all Hooverisms were Hoovervilles. Hoovervilles were teeming communities of makeshift shacks, often concentrated in cities close to soup kitchens run by charities. The shelters varied widely from occasional stone houses built by those with construction skills, to boxes thrown together with wooden crates, cardboard, tar paper, scraps of cloth and metal, and various other discarded materials. Within their shelters, most people had a stove, a few cooking implements, some bedding, a bucket for washing, and little else. The image on the slide here shows what was called the mansion. And it was the largest building in the New York City Central Park Hooverville. And the photo was taken in 1932. This is what another part of the Central Park Hooverville looked like. The coda to this lecture will look at a bit of the history of Central Park before, during, and after the Hooverville. Many folks at the time of the Depression remarked on the stark 
distinction between New York's luxury high-rise apartments and the Central Park Hooverville. The homeless settlement was not particularly popular with the tenants of the new Fifth Avenue and Central Park West apartments. But as evicted Hooverville residents simply returned because they literally had no place to go, wealthy New Yorkers resigned themselves to having prime views over the encampment. Central Park had the best known Hooverville in New York, but the city had plenty of others. In the image on the left, notice the pictures that people have brought. You can see them here, 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 a little bit here. They've probably brought them from homes that they have lost. And you can also see a broom here. And you can see the men dressed as neatly as possible, sitting on their front porches. People did not live in squalor because they didn't care or because they were lazy. Chicago had its own Hoovervilles. According to some sources, the term Hooverville originated in Chicago. Although I would be hesitant to assign a single source to something that spread so widely and so quickly. Because Chicago can get deadly cold periodically through the winter, police stations would open their floors for sleeping to folks in danger of freezing overnight. And that's what you see in this image on the slide. The main Hooverville in Chicago, Illinois, grew at the foot of Randolph Street near Grant Park. Interestingly, far from being chaotic, most Hoovervilles developed some form of self-governance. In the big Chicago Hooverville, a disabled former railroad brakeman and miner named Mike Donovan was given the title of mayor. Donovan gave interviews with the press and is quoted as saying, ours is a sort of communistic government. We pool our interests and when the commissary shows, that would be the place that sells food, shows signs of depletion, we appoint a committee to see what leavings the hotels have. He also observed that, quote, building construction may be at a standstill elsewhere, but down here, everything is booming. This was, of course, rather tongue-in-cheek, given that no matter how well or creatively constructed, Hoovervilles did not have access to plumbing or electricity. As you can see from the image of the man washing himself bit by bit using a rather small for the purpose bucket. Hoovervilles were not rare things or exceptions. They could be found in every one of the contiguous U.S. states. The image on this slide was taken at a large Hooverville situated along the banks of the Mississippi River, which you can just see in the background there, in St. Louis, Missouri. This camp held some 500 people, plus or minus as people came or went. Originally, the St. Louis Hooverville had four distinct racial sectors, but the residents themselves chose to integrate to, and this is a quote, support their city. And by that, they didn't mean St. Louis. They meant their Hooverville. I mentioned this in particular because history is so full of people being senselessly horrible to one another that I think it's worth pointing out that this is the result of choices. And by no means everyone makes the choice to destroy or harm others. In case you don't notice it on the slide, I just have to point out this rather adorable dog here who appears to have the rights to one of the few chairs that this guy has. Perhaps the longest lasting and best documented Hooverville developed in Seattle, Washington. Like New York, Chicago, and St. Louis, Seattle had multiple Hoovervilles, but the one on the tidal flats adjacent to the port of Seattle lasted for a full decade from 1931 to 1941. And that is, of course, what you're looking at on the slide. This Hooverville eventually covered nine acres and housed a population of up to 1,200. Initially, the health department posted notices on every shack, ordering the residents to vacate them within a week. The shacks were burned down, but it was not as if these folks could go anywhere else. The large Seattle Hooverville immediately reappeared, was burned once more, and built yet again, this time underground with 
hobble roofs made of tin or steel, which would not burn. The leader or mayor chosen by the Hooverville residents acted as a liaison between those with nothing and Seattle City Hall. Faced with the reality that folks could not just disappear by wishing, the health department finally relented and allowed them to stay, at which point they could build their shots above ground again. The only requirement was that they develop a system of safety and sanitary rules. This community actually remained until the land was needed for shipping facilities for World War II. And I pointed out in earlier slides, but you can see the laundry or really clearly hear the laundry. Again, people in poverty, they're not, they're not unclean by choice. And when they can possibly manage it, they keep their places clean and neat. Portland, Oregon developed multiple Hooverbills, as shown on this slide. You can see bridges of Portland in the background there. But along the western coast of the U.S., California received by far the most transients during the Depression years, ending up with 14% of the nation's dispossessed. Overwhelmed officials tried to figure out how to absorb as many as 6,000 migrants crossing its borders daily. California infrastructures were already overburdened, and the steady stream of newly arriving Americans was more than the system could bear. I don't know if any of you go to the Coachella Festival, but this is the venue as it appeared in 1935. Los Angeles' answer to the influx of desperately poor Americans was what the Los Angeles police chief called the bum blockade, despite the fact that the folks arriving were not bums in the sense that he implied, but people looking to do work. Los Angeles dispatched 136 police officers to 16 major points of entry to California on the Arizona, Nevada, and Oregon borders with orders to turn back migrants with, quote, no visible means of support. The bum blockade continued for several months as residents and migrants alike pointed out that city funds could be better used for positive projects rather than senseless punishment that left the actual problems that Americans face untouched. I've spent some time on Hoovervilles for the same reason that I explored tenements in the Gilded Age. These people were not poor and displaced because they were lazy or somehow inferior to those with enough money to weather the Depression. They were poor because of circumstances beyond their control, and they were displaced because they had no other reasonable ways of dealing with their situation. Clearing Hoovervilles might have made city residents more comfortable, but if anything, it only exacerbated the problem on a national level. Removing the homeless from one space wasn't going to make them disappear without a trace. These people still existed, and understandably, they objected to the idea that they should just die and get out of the way of better folks. The image on the screen is a Sacramento Hooverville because that is close to me where I am recording. The most extreme suppression of a Hooverville came right from the top and aimed to silence and disperse destitute veterans of the First World War who desperately needed assistance. This developed from a series of labor actions, marches, and protests in the early years of the Great Depression. Labor agitation did not disappear during the Great Depression. If anything, workers employed or laid off had even more reason to try to get those with power to understand the needs of the working classes. Unlike the situation in the Ukraine that we saw under the Soviet Union after World War I, during the Great Depression in the U.S., few people actually starved all the way to death. However, hunger and malnutrition did affect many and could be particularly hard on children whose bodies were just developing. In a country with abundant resources, a mammoth force of skilled and willing labor and the most productive industry in the world, many Americans found it hard to understand why the Depression had occurred 
and why it could not be resolved. Moreover, it was difficult for many to understand why people should go hungry in a country possessing huge food surpluses. By 1932, hunger marches, labor unrest, and small riots were common throughout the nation. In the images on this particular slide from 1932 and 1933 Chicago, notice that participants in these particular marches are not segregated by age, sex, or race. The group that organized the most inclusive marches and labor actions across the U.S. were the American Communist Party. Although often cast as zealots and sometimes linking themselves to the Soviet Union without an understanding of what was happening there, the Communist Party in the U.S. was for many a massively inclusive workers' union. One of the few organizations in the U.S. at the time that considered all workers, regardless of race, sex, skill level, or occupation. The American Communist Party formed what they called unemployed councils in cities across the U.S. These were fully integrated groups who worked together to block the evictions of tens of thousands of tenants who could not pay their rent, demanding work relief meaning public jobs for the unemployed, and home relief, aid for those who could not work, particularly women with dependent children and the disabled. In rural areas, communists also joined with other groups in fighting against farm foreclosures. The unemployed councils put together ideas for a program unheard of in the U.S. at the time, unemployment insurance. The concept of cooperative, government-run support for the unemployed was so identified with the scary communist party that the then conservative AFL, or American Federation of Labor, in voting the proposal down, that would be the proposal for unemployment insurance, in 1932, condemned it as a communistic program. We have been watching the collapse of American labor actions into an association with European political violence develop over decades now. And much of the white U.S. doubled down on this fully negative and not particularly well-informed image during the Great Depression. The Communist Party and its affiliated unemployed councils organized hunger marches across the U.S. during the worst days of the Depression. Marchers called for immediate relief and for long-term welfare programs to support the unemployed through future tough times. Look at ahead here. Pittsburgh was one of at least a dozen cities with unemployed councils in late 1931, and the city would host several hunger marches. In keeping with President Hoover's idea of volunteerism, the upper classes of the city had come up with what they called the Pittsburgh Plan, it was a 1931 scheme by major businesses to gather donations. Unsurprisingly, this was not equal to the scale of working class needs. The November 1931 Pittsburgh Hunger March, like others organized by the Communist Party, did not just shout, but had worked out clear strategies for the relief of struggling workers. The program put forward by the marchers included cash relief for the unemployed and their dependents, clothing and food for school children, a halt to evictions and home foreclosures, and government-funded relief work at union wages. A heavy police presence impeded the march in places, but the 1931 Pittsburgh Hunger March did not degenerate into violence. This would not be the case at other marches. We have met the Ford Motor Company in several lectures now. We know that during the 1920s, Ford was one of the richest employers in America. With the advent of the Great Depression, Ford laid off two-thirds of its employees. The Unemployed Councils, United Auto Workers Union, and Communist Union Organizing Groups organized a march to protest the employment policies of Ford Motor Company. On 6 March 1932, I know there are marches in the month of March here. On 6 month, March 1932, 
a group of Ford factory workers gathered to prepare for a marching demonstration planned for the next day. They had produced a 14-point list of demands that included jobs for laid-off employees, the right to organize unions, medical aid, increased wages, and an end to racially discriminate hiring. The march began on the morning of 7 March 1932 and included approximately 3,000 people. Former and current Ford workers, as well as other unemployed members of the community, met together at the edge of Detroit, planning to walk to the Ford River Rouge complex in Dearborn, Michigan, the main Ford factory that housed the company's unemployment office. March leaders addressed protesters, emphasizing the need for peaceful resistance and orderly behavior during the march. Dearborn police met the marchers with tear gas. The marchers managed to make it to the Ford factory despite this, but at the factory, Dearborn police, the Dearborn Fire Department, Detroit police, Michigan State Police, and, showing that gains since the Gilded Age remained limited, Ford Motor Company's private security force attacked the marchers. That's five different armed groups attacking the marchers. In addition to tear gas from police, the fire department hit protesters with high-pressure cold water from their fire hoses. Then, in a pattern we have seen repeatedly now, the police and Ford security began to shoot at the crowds of marchers. In this case, they killed four marchers and injured over 60 more. You can see that the Ford Hunger March was called a riot by some newspapers. It says here, tear gas bombs hurled as riot rages in Dearborn. But it also became known as the Ford Massacre and sparked an outcry against police brutality. On 12 March 1932, Around 60,000 people came together for a funeral procession for the four dead marchers, all four of whom were members of the Young Communist League. In this case, the outcry had no tangible effects. The Ford Motor Company continued to repress workers, including firing employees for possessing socialist literature. The repression of the Ford Hunger March took place in March of 1932. That same month, another protest began to form that would elicit an even more out-of-proportion response and remove any reasonable doubt about Hoover's future in the 1932 presidential election. We will pick up with the Bonus Army in part two of this lecture.